Korea to Germany. From Alaska to Puerto Rico. All over the world, the United States Army is on the alert to defend our country, you, the American people, against aggression. This is the big picture. An official television report to the nation from the United States Army. Now, to show you part of the big picture, here is Sergeant Stuart Queen. A fascinating but little known organization is the Army's exhibit unit, which visually dramatizes vital parts of the Army's story. For our first story on the pictorial report today, we will show you the operation of this unit and one of its most striking displays, the recreation of prison camp life in North Korea. This was Pyoktong, POW Camp No. 5. In appearance, it was just one of many small villages in North Korea. But there was a difference. The winter months were the worst. There were 16 of us in a 10 by 12 foot room. Sleeping was quite a trick. Cold? You could cut the air with a knife. This was called the icebox. The guards every now and then threw water on us. And then would get a kick out of watching it freeze to our skin. But then there was always the hospital, well equipped with a doctor who was an expert at handling crude knives, sharp scissors, or anything else available. You'd need a hospital after hanging like this for a few hours, or was it a few days? This was home for 33 days. It was during the rainy season, and sometimes the water would rise as high as my chin. Ever been given a hot foot? Well, I'd have given anything for one that day. Name, rank, serial number? I can't remember how many times I said it. Yes, it did happen in Korea, and it is happening here, thanks to the efforts and talents of the U.S. Army Exhibit Unit. Here is the story behind this true-to-life presentation. Backstage, we see final details of the exhibit taking place. On a frame device, the prisoner of war scenes are adjusted so as to appear in an opening of the exhibit sky. Rotation of the frame holding the POW scenes in place, in coordination with a tape recorder, reveals to the audience out front, Exhibit A. We call this the icebox. Our POW backstage story really begins when a branch of the Army requests an exhibit. Once approved, things happen and fast. Not a minute is wasted before the designers are working on blueprints and plans. Then the sculptors take over to make the original model of the exhibit. Art department's door opens a hundred times a day. Inside exhibit details are firmed out and supervised by Mr. Charles Plasto, the POW presentation takes shape. In proper hands, a useless piece of cardboard becomes a character of vital meaning. And in only a short time, what was a mold of clay becomes a symbol of oppression. So gradually, POW Camp No. 5 unfolds itself and bears its ugly face for inspection. An exact reproduction, only the materials are different. Cardboard instead of flesh, plexiglass, styrofoam, celastic, and just plain grass, instead of blood, disease, and death. Exhibit A, Prisoner of War. One of the many hundreds of such exhibits produced by the U.S. Army Exhibit Unit. Located at Cameron Station, Virginia. This is home and workshop for more than 50 sculptors, designers, photographers, cabinet makers, electronic specialists, and artists. Everything from a miniature reproduction of the Washington Monument to an exact model of an atomic cannon is possible here. In other words, they are jacks of all trades and masters in all. And masters in showmanship, too, displaying for the American public the vital role played today by the U.S. Army. 
Since the end of World War II, Japan has been recovering steadily from the destruction and the humiliation of that war. To the United States Army, which went to Japan as an occupation force and stays there now by mutual consent as a protector, Japan has also been winning a place of honor and trust. One of the functions which reflects this trust is the operation of the Japanese security guard. Installations of the United States Army in Tokyo are today guarded by Japanese men and women. These Japanese symbolizing the progress Japan has made and the respect she has earned in the years since World War II are employed by the Army and entrusted with many important duties. Serious-minded and well-disciplined, they carry out their assignments with an alertness and devotion to duty which were once recognized as the best qualities of the Japanese soldier. The guards are efficiently organized into a security guard division, an official branch of the Army Provo Marshal's office in Tokyo. With a strength of almost 2,000 guards, the division supplies protection to some 90 military installations in the Tokyo area and permits Army commanders to use their own troops for more vital work. The Army furnishes the uniforms, but pride in uniform, that elusive but all-important quality which indicates spirit and high morale in any unit is supplied by the guards themselves. Illustrating the high esprit de corps which exists in the security guard division, the guards purchase their own uniform accessories, the large white belts, lanyards and white boot laces, which give their uniforms an added sparkle. Although it is not a military unit, the security guard division is organized along military lines. An extensive training course is given to all guards, both men and women, before they are placed on duty. Women guards are used primarily to protect the living quarters of wax and women civilians working for the government. These students are learning the proper way to execute the hand salute traditional military greeting. Their instructors are Japanese. Only two army officers and two enlisted men supervise the entire security guard division. The guards training is as varied as their duties. Since they are taking the place of American soldiers, they must be just as capable of meeting emergencies of all kinds. They must be ready not only to protect property, but to save lives if necessary. Consequently, they are drilled thoroughly in the techniques of artificial respiration. And first aid. Practicing on each other, they learn how to bandage, apply tourniquets, make splints, and many other principles of emergency care. The guard's first duty, the protection of property, carries with it an implicit ability to protect himself on the job. The nightstick, or riot club, is his chief weapon. In learning how to use it, his training program begins to get rough. In the flair with which these guards handle their riot clubs, students of Japanese lore might detect the historical influence of the samurai warriors of an earlier day in Japan. However, we can see here even a stronger influence of the present-day training techniques of the Army's Corps of Military Police. Army training techniques extend to the rifle range, where guards learn to fire Army weapons under the supervision of American officers. Japan, completely demobilized at the end of the war, still has no Army today. But in the post-war years, Japan has been emerging as a potentially strong and stable force for peace in the East. And it can be reasonably expected that the future will find her building a new army to help defend that peace. training which is being given today to these members of the security guard will prove to be very useful. 
for these men and the members of all Japanese constabulary forces who are being trained could well serve as a nucleus of that army. The Japanese guards take their training seriously. They spend hours on the drill field, mastering the look of what our soldiers call a sharp unit. By the time their training is completed, they will be a credit to any military outfit. In their well-dressed ranks, the Army finds not only efficient and trustworthy custodians to guard its property, but also strong friends and formidable allies for the future. Periodically, for special occasions, members of the Security Guard Division hold formal reviews on their own time. It gives them an opportunity to show off their organization in parade ground pageantry. With each battalion proudly bearing its own colors, the guards assemble to pass and review before representatives of the U.S. Army. Today, a new Japan, regaining her pride and her strength, is ready to take her new place of honor among the free nations of the world. In these formations of the Japanese security police, who serve the United States Army today, there can be seen the emerging shape of a security guard for a peaceful Orient. The Army Map Service is the largest mapping service in the world. Among its components are the mobile mapping units which can follow combat organizations into action, producing on the spot large quantities of maps for the all essential guidance of troops in battle. In Germany, you will see one of these mobile units in action. The job of making maps for the army in the field falls to engineer topographic companies like the 524, here, setting out on a training mission in Germany. Exercises like this one, in which the 524th will provide maps to support a core maneuver, keep these companies highly trained and ready to map any area in the world. The 524th is a fully mobile unit, carrying all its equipment with it. Operating under tactical conditions, the company's first step after reaching the area to be mapped is to protect itself from enemy observation. After the equipment is set up, survey teams gather the material for the map, which will be the combat unit's most reliable source of information about the area, often its only source. Working swiftly, these specialists ascertain everything there is to know about the land and its features, both natural and man-made. They determine the condition and the dimensions of the roads that cut through the area, the rise and fall of the ground, the ridges, the wooded areas, and the open spaces that mark it. Team members test the depth of streams and other bodies of water in the area, and the capacity of the bridges over them, information which would be vital to a commander. Under the probing of these soldier engineers and the instruments they use, the topography of the entire area is reduced to basic engineering formulae.
Inside a company van in the bivouac area, technicians go to work on the information the survey teams have gathered. First, the identification of the map is set in the margin. Its name, scale, contour level, all the information which will enable the user to read and understand the map quickly. The bridges and streams, the roads and ridges and hills, studied by the survey team, are transferred to paper as lines and symbols in an exact representation of the area. A separate drawing is made for each color used. After the finished product is edited carefully, the map is ready for reproduction. It is photographed in another company van. Each color drawing for multiple color maps is photographed separately. A final inspection is given to the negatives. If a minor error is discovered here, it can still be corrected by retouching the negative. In another van, technicians prepare the offset lithographic plates for printing the map. If offset plates are regrained, they can be used many times, thus saving large amounts of money. The plates are sensitized with a material which is distributed evenly by a centrifugal force dryer. The color drawing negatives are printed onto the sensitized plates with arc lights. The plates are developed and are sent on to the printing press van. Here, the map sheet passes through the press as many times as there are different colors each time adding new information. The printing presses of an engineer topographic company can produce from 3,000 to 5,000 impressions an hour. When the maps are finished, they go to yet another van for trimming and baling. Thus, the 524th Engineer Topographic Company completes its mission in support of a core maneuver. For our last report today, let us look at the American Forces Network, which supplies American-style radio services to our armed forces in Europe. An historic castle in the suburbs of Frankfurt, Germany, is the key station in a vast radio network operated by the United States Armed Forces. In charge of the Frankfurt station, and on hand now to explain the function of the network, is Captain Joseph Given. I'm a reserve officer on active duty with the Army, and I feel fortunate that I may pursue a radio activity while in the uniform. AFN Frankfurt is the key network station of the American Forces Network, and as such has a dual role. We furnish network programming to the rest of the stations in the network, and we also serve our local area of Frankfurt, Heidelberg, and Wiesbaden. From the standpoint of personnel, we have 56 people working here. 41 of those are enlisted men of the American military service, three are American civilians, and 12 German nationals. In programming, 80% of our programming is network caliber feed. The other 20% is of a local nature. One of the most important of the network's functions is the broadcasting of news. The Frankfurt station operates a newsroom like that in any large commercial center. News from all over the world comes into the news bureau and is disseminated factually and objectively by announcers in uniform. Celebration of the 36th anniversary of the Russian Revolution. Paris. The French Parliament American troops rely heavily on these news broadcasts to keep informed on what is happening not only in Germany, but everywhere else on the globe. And in addition to American troops and civilians, many citizens of Europe have come to regard the American radio report as one of the most authoritative sources of information available. And that's it from the Associated Press, the United Press, and the International News Service. 
The next newscast over this network is scheduled for 1815 hours this afternoon. A regular feature of the Frankfurt station is the broadcasting of religious services of all faiths. Used to the chaplain's branch presents Jewish Sabbath evening services. Our speaker tonight will be Chaplain Joseph B. Messing, Frankfurt Municipal Detachment. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Praise be his name, whose glorious kingdom is forever and ever. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be upon thy heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt speak of them when thou sittest in thy house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be for frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the doorposts of thy house and upon thy gate that ye may remember unto all my commandments and be holy unto your God. Among entertainment programs, music ranks high in popularity. Listeners represent a variety of tastes, so the station gives them a wide selection. Here is a study in sound. Again, we are assembled, the Joe Cardinal Quartet, four capables with four instruments and many new fresh ideas of modern jazz, and me, Private Frank Batters. So let's study the sounds and observe on this opening song the intricate, delicate, round sounds of which we speak. If you listen carefully, you'll note this is much like I Only Have Eyes for You. Sports events traditionally are favorite forms of recreation for Americans, and the American Forces Network faithfully brings this kind of recreation to its listeners. Here, broadcasters are at Landstuhl, Germany, to report on a football game between Air Force teams from Landstuhl and Wiesbaden air bases. When a Navy salvage crew tries to retrieve an Army vehicle which has plunged into the Rhine River, the station sends a reporter to find out what is happening. Now here we have the young sailor who's going to go down and get this car back for the 
U.S. Army this afternoon. What is your name, please? Uh, George Holstein. George Holstein. And where are you from? Kingston, New York. Uh -huh. That's upstate New York, isn't it? Yeah. Is this the... I don't... I know it isn't your first trip. How many uh, dives have you made such as this? Oh, such as this, well... I haven't made too many before I come over to Germany, but since we've been over here, we've been diving quite a bit. Because uh, the Army... There's a lot of Army over here, a lot of lakes. Guys all the time going out in the lakes and getting drowned. And these bridging operations, they're always... Things are always falling off them. And you're the boys called upon. Yeah. The small little Navy unit here is really well known in Germany then, aren't you? A little bit, I guess. Uh -huh. This kind of on-the-spot reporting of interesting events is a regular feature of the American Forces Network. As the diver descends into the river to begin his search for the lost car, the reporter describes what is going on in detail for his radio audience. In the station, technicians keep open the channels which carry the reporter's first-hand account of the success of the salvage operation. Now the car is completely out of the water. And during this operation, up to, oh, about a half hour ago, an army crane has just arrived on the scene to take this car back to its respective motor pool, I believe Darmstadt, wherever the car came from, and perhaps salvage, salvage the car for whatever they can. Didn't get banged up too much. The uh, top naturally is pushed in and the sides pretty well banged. After more than a decade of constantly expanding and improving service, the mission of the American Forces Network remains constant to broadcast the best of radio fare for the information, education, and entertainment of the American forces in Europe. The men and women of the United States Army are the best equipped and the best trained in the world. And because of functions like the American Forces Network, the best informed. Now this is Sergeant Stuart Queen, inviting you to be with us again over this same channel next week for another look at the big picture, the United States Army in action. The Big Picture is a weekly television report to the nation on the activities of the Army at home and overseas. Produced by the Signal Corps Pictorial Center. Presented by the U.S. Army in cooperation with this station. You can be an important part of the big picture. You can proudly serve with the best equipped, the best trained, the best fighting team in the world today, the United States Army.